was written. Hughes Associates is now Jensen Hughes. We merged with RJA, so a bit of housekeeping. Um, I'd like to start just by thanking everybody at the National Park Service. We had a lot of support getting this project underway and um, making it a successful project, including people here at the Jefferson National um, Gateway Expansion Memorial. I see Ed Dodds is in the room, but also at the Denver, Denver Service Center and the Midwest region. So the National Park Service was actually looking to do a more holistic approach to re reviewing the gateway arch. So we saw this morning all the work that was done on the exterior. They approached us to look at what happens on the interior to review the fire and life safety systems. Namely, we wanted to look at the fire and life safety within the arch all the way up to the observation deck. Is that a safe space? Can we make it a safe space if it is not? So there are a number of key challenges with the arch and in other historical and cultural facilities that make it difficult from a fire protection standpoint. We can't use our typical methods. As a fire protection engineer, we might look at something and say, oh, well, you need another exit, just build a, a concrete enclosed staircase over there. Um, obviously, for something like the arch, we're not going to say, put a staircase along the outside of the arch, or let's just close off this entire section. There's both practical, aesthetic, and preservation reasons why we can't use our typical methods. So, um, so specifically within the arch, we have this very large interconnected volume. Most of the spaces within the arch are connected to the other, all the other spaces in the arch, um, which goes against typical fire protection tenants, which would be to separate by floor, by volume, by area. Um, we don't want to do that here, if, if at all possible. Um, there's obviously very long exit routes. It's 630 feet to the top of the to the top of the observation deck. Something like a thousand plus stairs. Um, those exit routes also share a common volume. So when you're coming down the two legs of the arch, either way you're going through that visitor center to exit the building. Um, the last is that traditional methods might not be appropriate. You can't really stick sprinklers inside the arch. I mean, I suppose you could. They wouldn't be that effective. Um, there are some tricks to putting detection inside the arch as well. So wh when we were asked to look at this, we had to, we had to come up with a new way to approach this issue. Unfortunately, in fire protection, there's already a systematized approach that we can use that we call performance-based design. And what performance-based design looks at is not the code says we have to have two exits and they have to be rated two hours and such and such and such and the stairs need to be three feet wide. Performance-based design says, okay, the code says that the, the stair needs to be three feet wide. Well, the intent of that is to make sure that everybody can get out safely and in a timely manner. So we look at, well, can we meet the intent of these, of these requirements, which is life safety, without meeting the actual letter of the requirement? So the, the overall approach to that would be to, to define your scope. What are we looking to, uh, what are we looking to do? Define your objectives, in this case, fire and life safety and preservation. We don't want those to conflict. Um, establish criteria. How are we going to say whether or not this meets our goals? Then we analyze it. We crunch our numbers. We do whatever we need to do. And finally, we propose solutions as, as needed. So for the arch, we, um, we looked at a, a multi-step approach. Our, our goal here was to, we, our primary focus was on life safety up at the observation deck. Can we safely get people from the observation deck out of the building in the event of a fire? So we have two primary forces at play here. We have the fire itself. What kind of environment is that going to be causing in the, in the structure? And we have the people. How long does it take them to get out? Where are they going to be at certain points in the evacuation? 
at any point in time are we going to have smoke and fire conditions that are unsafe at the same time and location where people are trying to exit. So in order to do that, we built a model to evaluate the fire. We built a model to evaluate the occupant movement. And finally, we, we compared those and our results gave us some pretty promising um, ideas about how we could approach life safety in the arts. And with that, I'll turn it over to, I'll turn it over to Anne, who will go through the, um, the process for developing a 3D model for the arch. So we were really excited about um, being able to work on the arch, work at the arch, and also to build this model. Uh, just to go over the, the interior uh, components of the arch, which uh, the previous group really didn't seem to, to care about much. Um, <coughs> there's the uh, anchors into that. These areas down here, way down, those are the loading zones for the elevator, for the tram system that takes you up through the arch or back down. Um, the, the tram goes from here to here and from here to here on each side. Um, in between, there's a, there's a maintenance space for the for the tram cars in this zone, and then it goes, it goes right on up. And essentially, half of the arch going up is where the elevator ride, and half of it is everything else. There's also a small elevator that goes up, I guess, to about here. Um, and it's actually, it's not a straight up and down elevator. It goes, it goes at a little angle. So. There were a lot of challenges in making this model. These are the original drawings. And, and truly, we looked at them. And before we had come out here and seen what it actually was, we were totally mystified. We had no idea what we were looking at. Um, you know, you have this uh, the sort of the Washington Monument plan here. Uh, you've got, you know, these. Th this one, is, it was just mystifying. So um, there are sections, the, the drawings are ex really, really complete. And once you know what you're looking at, they're, they're amazing that they could actually have designed this and have uh, drawn it. So um, it, but it, it did take some looking at. It turns out that this sort of stack of stairs here um, go up along uh, the extra dose, but on the interior. Um, and in, they're like switchback stairs, but instead of switching back over each other every time, they go out. So they're sort of like accordion folded each time. So that's what you're actually looking at. You're looking at a plan with all of the stairs going out to one side below you. Um, then there are some areas with with sort of normal stairs. And then when you get up to the top, um, there are stairs that, that have straight sections with spiral sections connecting them. Uh, but it, it, it's hard to figure out from the drawings. But it's all there. Then we called uh, this one up here. That was the necktie plan. And again, we, we just really didn't know what it was all about until we came, came out to visit. I'm sorry. Uh, and then finally at the top, this one we did understand. This one is a little, a little more uh, typical. Uh, and so the, the elevator loading, this is the elevator loading platform from here to here so that there's a door into each of the little tram cars. And then there's the observation deck up here. 
Then the challenge was, okay, we figured out what it is. How are we going to draw this? Well, we uh, had initially thought that we would send the original drawings to a drafting service called QCAD that makes Revit or CAD documents out of your hard copy drawings. Well, they didn't know what it looked like either. So they quoted me $30,000 to, to uh, build the Revit model. So we said, OK. <laughs> Got all the interns together and said, here you go. So we, we thought about different ways of doing it, whether we could model the skins you know, by sort of building the geometric shape. Um, and what we eventually decided was we were going to build it the same way that it was originally built, that we were going to build the blocks, the, fr the frames, the cans, whatever, whatever you want to call them, and we're going to stack them up, and then we're going to draw the stair in and uh, the ducts, because those were the big things. What we needed to do for, for Jennifer and Hughes was to um, model the space and then and the major obstructions. So within the arch legs, the major obstructions are the stairs and the, uh, there are two big ducts that go up through the, through the legs. And then we had to model the, the stuff at the base. But again, that was pretty standard architectural stuff. So that, that wasn't a big deal. So there we are with all the different types of stairs, the ducts, the loading zones, everything into the section. Um, it was done in, in Revit 2013. And we found when we were trying to get uh, images out for this presentation that in one of the changes between 2013 and 2014, uh, when we opened it in 2014, the stairs were gone. So, so that wasn't a good thing at all. <laughs> Uh, so we got a, uh, a we found you know got a backed up version of 2013 and opened it and then we were we were good to go. Uh, so you can see how the stairs and the, these ducts run up through. The loading platforms are down in uh, down in this area. I I love the the view on the left. It just it looks like a, like a slinky or something. It's just. <laughs> bouncing along there on those, those stairs. But, but these are those stairs that, uh, that run along the outside uh, of, the, of the arch. And I also have to apologize that the rails are drawn incorrectly on the stairs. Uh, we found that if we did use the actual pipe railings, we would have had to draw the actual pipe railings. It wouldn't do it for you. We could. We could set up the family with this kind of railing, but not the two pipe rails. So it's not totally accurate, but it was it, it enabled us to do the used to do the calculations. So that's what Jennifer will talk to you about. So once we had this very lovely, very nice 3D model from Anne. We had to do our fire model, which unfortunately doesn't get run directly from Revit or CAD. So what we were able to do is use that model to build on top of. In some cases, we were able to import it directly into the fire model that we're using. It's called the Fire Dynamic Simulator, or FDS. This is basically the industry standard. Almost, you know, most projects involving fire modeling use this model. So we, we, we got the model into the, um, into the program. We developed the, the scenarios that we we're going to model. And then finally, we looked at the, the environment within the arch based on the predictions of the model. So here's the construction of this model. Um, unfortunately, the model uses must conform to a rectilinear grid. So basically, imagine building the arch with Legos. Um, you can see in the inset here, oops, that's not what I wanted. You can see in the inset how one section of the arch would have been broken up. Um, in the inset on the right, you have the skin is hidden and you can see the stairs and the ducts. Unfortunately, with this model, you have to be somewhat selective about what you're gonna include. 
for time reasons of setup and also for resolution reasons. You can't model every one inch piece of pipe or that sort of thing. What we really wanted to capture was the volume. So the main features we included were the stairs and the ductwork that goes all the way up to the top, including, and as well as the skin. And then in a little more detail, both at the base of the arch and the observation area. Because again, we have this entire section at the bottom there from the lobby to the ramps to the loading zone is all interconnected. Once we had the basic geometry, we had to just do um, develop fire scenarios. As a fire protection engineer, my first question is, will it burn? Um, basically, it's generally not the building itself that's the fire fire hazard. It's more, it's all, most often it's the contents of the building. Fortunately, with this space, the park service has done an excellent job at good housekeeping. We did not find any areas where there were excessive amounts of fuel. The fuel loading was all very low and well well controlled, which really helped us keep keep from having to do very extreme scenarios, which is honestly a breath of fresh air in this in this industry. Most often I get told by clients that, oh, we won't have any fuel there, and then you'll come in and there'll be giant pallets or a 10-foot tall Christmas tree. <laughs> One, one special scenario that we considered, there was a concern that the hoist cabling that operates the tram would be a major source of fire since it goes from the top to the bottom and could serve as basically to spread the fire from, you know, throughout the arch. It is um, a lubricated cable so that lubricant could potentially burn. Fortunately, we were able to get a sample of the cable that was no longer in use and tested in our laboratory. And you can see you do, you can get ignition of this cable, but what we found was that you couldn't sustain ignition on the cable. Once you removed your heat source, it, it died out and went away within a few seconds, less than a minute. So last is the pretty pictures. So what we have here is a time lapse over 20 minutes. On the left is the smoke. It's more of a, a, a realistic visual. On the right, what we have is a more quantitative analysis. This is the visibility, which often we find is the first thing that is compromised in a fire scenario. So as you can see here, the fire, excuse me, for this fire at the base of the arch, you have, it takes a long time for this fire to fill this arch um, on the order of 10 minutes to get to the top. And after 20 minutes, you haven't really gone up down the other side. So that, that was the big, big takeaway that we took from this is that because of this huge volume of the arch and the fact that we have two exits, which I'll get to in a minute, um, this was a, a relatively safe, safe structure. So having the, having the fire conditions in the arch, for the next thing we wanted to look at was the exiting time. How long does it take? Are people still up in that observation deck when the smoke reaches it? So again, we looked to another computer model known as Building Exodus um, to evaluate the time it takes to get from the very top to the very bottom. Some of the challenges that we saw in the modeling the arch exit particularly is fatigue. This is 630 feet high. Um, unfamiliarity, slower speeds. It, these, these stairs um, at the very top are very narrow and spiral stairs. As you go along, you might expand, but it's still fairly narrow stairs. This um, image was shown here shows that there's not room, there's, you could probably pass on these stairs but you couldn't fit two people side to side, so you're basically talking about a line of people going down from the top. And we also don't know how, how mobile occupants are, if they have any phobias, you know, fear of heights, claustrophobia that might come into play. Um, but basically what, what we did to, to, to look at that is to just vary several factors. You know, if, if, you know, slow down the speeds. We looked at putting in several waypoints along the way, forcing people to stop for a minute or two minutes, 
um, just to take a break and how that affected the overall time. In general, I believe we saw somewhere between 20 minutes and an hour that it would take to get from the bottom, depending on all those various factors. So the, the last piece of this puzzle was now we have the fire model results, which show how much time we have available. And we have the egress results that show how much time we need. Hopefully, one of those is greater than the other. Um, so we kind of looked at that at, at several different points along the way. Uh, it might be difficult to read, but the observation platform at the top was one point. How long does it take to actually get within the leg of the arch? The end of the spiral staircase section, and then the third line is the elevator landing. Um, and then last, how you get down all the way to the bottom through the visitor center and out. Again, these were evaluated more in the qualitative, I'm sorry, the quantitative aspects, which was first visibility, which like I said, is generally the first thing to um, disappear. Then, um, but we also did look at temperature and uh, toxicity. Um, I will, at, at this point, I don't have any specific details, but I will say that because of the large volume of the space and the fact that we do have two exits, we found that we have plenty of time. This was not really an issue of not having the time needed for people to safely exit. This building is, or structure, I guess you might say, is, um, is inherently very safe. Um, you saw in the video, over 20 minutes, we were just making it to the top. It might take very long to get out all the way to the bottom, but it's only gonna take a few minutes to get past the point where the smoke occurs. So we found that we didn't need to recommend very many specific strategies. We didn't have to have them put in you know, entirely new stairs or um, anything like that. The, the few strategies that we recommended, there was one, this is a case where an innovative solution that would not have been around at the time that this was constructed. We have these video image detection systems that actually use computer algorithms and cameras within the within the structure to identify smoke um, and basically work as video smoke detectors. This is a, a relatively new technology, but it's, it's well suited to something like the ARCH. Um, and it's something that would help provide fast detection and operational awareness so that you can radio, confirm the issue, have people going, get going, and in the right direction, which is the key thing. The last thing that we recommended was, again, because everybody comes in through the, for the, the lower half of the, um, through the visitor center, you could potentially have smoke in the visitor center that you wouldn't be exposed to coming down from the arch, but you have to go through to get out of the building. So what we recommended was to basically put in some very simple barriers that could be hidden away um, when they're not needed and activated in the event of a fire, that would basically separate that out so you would have two separate egress paths. So in conclusion, um, this is you know, a historical building that we, we um, needed to treat separate, in a special condition to make sure that it was both safe, that we met our preservation goals, and um, fortunately our analysis resulted in a few things that might be beneficial, but overall a very safe arch. Questions?